Beyond presents spoilers for the tragedy of Antony by Robert Garnier, translated by Mary Sidney. Following are some introductory notes and a plain text recording of the dialogue to Act 1 and a bit of Act 2, the plain text being a first cut edit of our full cast audio adaptation coming soon. It has all the text, but no SFX, no Foley, and it's the edit we use to hunt out textual errors, retakes or cuts, so it's not perfect and we may change the take for the final thing. If you want to just enjoy our production when we produce it, stop listening now and wait for the release. Or if you're listening in the future, look for the episode further up the podcast list. Seriously, this is an exercise that some listeners don't enjoy. If it ain't for you, move on. If you're still listening, let's enter spoiler land. Spoiler, spoiler, la ha 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 One day, I will stop. Before I start, this is a play with themes of suicide throughout. Uh, though there isn't anything particularly explicit here, just be warned. It's also a play set during war, so death and destruction are part of the mix. So, the opening to Antony is a little odd. It's a neoclassical play, uh, so there are a lot of people making speeches, occasional dialectical exchanges, and each act gets a chorus, except Act 2 gets two choruses, and Act 1's chorus sort of... it's confusing. So, for this episode, I am covering Act 1 and the opening of Act 2, as a single unit of action. I'm sure that isn't the intent of the authors, but it's how I'm treating it for performance, because otherwise it's just really weird. I mean, it's a, it's a bit of a problem. Uh, also, by doing so, we even out the acts so that each is about the same length. Tidiness isn't an essential part of dramaturgy. In fact, it's often the death, but it does make the audio adaptation slightly easier to edit. I think I went on about this at length in the exploring episodes, so I won't overplay my opinion here. So, Act 1 starts after the Battle of Actium, after the general rout and failure of Mark Antony's military campaign against Augustus Caesar, Octavius, I suppose at this point, and the historically dubious suggestion that during Actium, Cleopatra fled the sea battle and Antony followed and abandoned his men all because of love. It's, it's more probable that the battle was always about fleeing a relatively doomed position by this point and that Antony was always probably going to have to leave much of his remaining forces behind to the whim of Augustus. As it happened, Augustus was quite reasonable with them, but no one knew that at the time. But we're not concerned with what really happened, but with the play world that we are reading. Antony feels that he was led astray from his manly fortitude by his love for Cleopatra. And to show this, the play opens with Antony making a speech about how everything is Cleopatra's fault because he acted because of her. He's a bit of a mess, frankly. Since cruel heavens against me obstinate, since all mishaps of the round engine do conspire my harm, since men, since powers divine, air, earth, and sea are all injurious, and that my queen herself, in whom I lived the idol of my heart, doth me pursue, it meet I die. The play doesn't give us any meaningful stage directions. Antony is alone. Is he drinking? Is he perhaps holding a weapon? So the question here of his death is more pointed, as it were. He continues his misogynistic vein, blaming Cleo for his turning against Rome and Caesar, and just to remind you again, the Caesar in this case is Augustus, or Brian Blessed. For her have I forgone my country, Caesar unto war provoked, for just revenge of sisters wrong, my wife, who moved my queen. Ah, me, to jealousy, for love of her, in her allurements caught abandoned life. I honour have despised, 
disdained my friends, and of the stately Rome despoiled the empire of her best attire, contemned that power that made me so much feared, a slave become unto her feeble face. So, with the list of his failures, and he is a bit of a failure, he goes on to blame Cleo. Oh, cruel traitress, woman most unkind, thou dost forsworn my love and life betray, and givest me up to rageful enemy, which soon, oh, fool, will plague thy perjury. He blames her for giving up and leaving him with nothing, that she is betraying him to Caesar. Yielded Pelesium on this country's shore, Yielded thou hast my ships and men of war, That nought remains so destitute am I, But these same arms which on my back I wear. Thou shouldst have had them too, And me unarmed yielded to Caesar naked of defence, which while I bear, let Caesar never think triumph of me shall his proud chariot grace, nor think with me his glory to adorn on me alive to use his victory. And so he goes on. Cleopatra triumphs because he fell for her. And you can see his arrogance bubbling up under the self-pity. He wasn't beaten by force, except he was several times, but by her womanly charms. Oh, thou only Cleopatra triumph hast, thou only hast my freedom servile made, thou only hast me vanquished, not by force, for force I cannot be, but by sweet baits of thy eyes graces, which did gain so fast upon my liberty that naught remained. None else henceforth but thou, my dearest queen, shall glory in commanding Antony. All of which self-pity isn't really true. He lost the war, but though Caesar has won, he won't get Antony except as a corpse. Suicide, again, as the underlying theme of this speech. Have Caesar fortune and the gods his friends to him have love and fatal sisters given the sceptre of the earth? He never shall subject my life to his obedience. But when that death, my glad refuge, shall have bounded the course of my unsteadfast life and frozen corpse under a marble cold within tomb's bosom widow of my soul, then at his will let him its subject make. Then what he will let Caesar do with me. Make me limb after limb be rent. Make me my burial take in sides of Thracian wolf. And we're back into self-pity. It's never a good sign when a character talks about himself in the third person. And here Antony is talking of himself as the hero he was reputed to be. The great Antony, who is no more because of Cleopatra. Here he develops the theme that his love wasn't created by Cupid, but by other darker forces. Poor Antony! Alas, what was the day, the days of loss that gave thee thy love? Wretch, Antony, since Megara pale with snaky hairs enchained thy misery. The fire thee burnt was never Cupid's fire, for Cupid bears not such a mortal brand. It was some fury's torch, Orestes' torch, which sometimes burned his mother murdering soul, when wandering mad, rage boiling in his blood, he fled his fault which followed as he fled, kindled within his bones by a shadow pale of mother slain returned from Stygian lake. Since he fell in love, everything has turned to shit. Listing his less successful campaigns where he had to decimate his forces to get out alive. Antony, poor Antony, since that day thy good old hap did far from thee retire. Thy virtue dead, thy glory made alive so oft by martial deeds is gone in smoke. 
Sidst then the bay, so well thy forehead knew, to Venus myrtles yielded have their place. Trumpets to pipes, field tents to courtly bowers, lances and pikes to dances and to feasts. Since then, O oh wretch, instead of bloody wars, thou shouldst have made upon the Parthian kings for Rome and honour filed by Crassus' foil. Thou threwst thou curious off and fearful helm with coward courage unto Egypt's queen, in haste to run about her neck to hang languishing in her arms thy idol make. In sum, given up to Cleopatra's eyes. Rather than be a warrior, he was a lover, etc. Then to the effects of his love, Romans. Romans everywhere. Thou breakest at length from thence, as one enchalmed breaks from the enchanter that him strongly held. For thy first reason, spoiling of their force the poison cups of thy fair sorceress, we cured thy sprite, and then on every side thou madest to gain the earth with soldiers swarm. All Asia hid. Euphrates' banks do tremble to see at once so many Romans there breathe horror, rage, and with a threatening eye in mighty squadrons cross his swelling streams. Ah, oh, naught seen but horse and fiery sparkling arms, naught heard but hideous noise of muttering troops. The path, the mead, abandoned in their goods, hide them for fear in hills of Hercany, redoubted me. Then willing to besiege the great freight head of Medea, thou campest at her walls with vain assault, thy engines fit armies oh, hath not thither brought. And yet he doesn't really care about all those things because he always returns to Cleopatra and all the rest of the world can go hang. So long thou stayst, so long thou dost thee rest, so long thy love with such things nourished reframes, reforms itself, and stealingly retakes his force and re-becomes more great. For of thy queen the looks, the grace, the words, sweetness, allurements, amorous delights, enter again thy soul and day and night, in watch, in sleep, her image followed thee. Not dreaming but of her, repenting still that thou for war had such a goddess left. Thou carest no more for path, nor Parthian bow. Sallies, assaults, encounters, shocks, alarms for ditches, rampiers, wards, and trenchant grounds. Thy only care in sight of Nilus streams, sight of that face whose guileful semblance doth wandering in thee infect thy tainted heart. Her absence thee besots, each hour, each hour of stay to thee impatient seems an age. Enough of conquest. Praise thou deemst enough, if soon enough the bristle fills thou see of fruit-filled Egypt, and the stranger flood thy queen's fair eyes, another pharos lights. He's thrown away an empire for Cleopatra and her shining eyes. And what has he got? Nothing. Octavia and their children gone, the empire and reputation in it gone. Oh, return blow, dishonoured, despised, in wanton love, a woman thee mislead, sunk in foul sink. Meanwhile, respected not thy wife Octavia and her tender babes, of whom the long contempt against thee whets the sword of Caesar, now thy lord become. Lost thy great empire, all those goodly towns, reverence thy name as rebels now thee leave, rise against thee. 
And to the ensign's flock of conquering Caesar, who in walls thee round caged in thy hold, scarce master of thyself, late master of so many nations. And yet is this loss the greatest loss? Nope, it's Cleopatra, and his belief that she will abandon him to save her own skin. Yet, yet, which is of grief, extremest grief, which is yet of mischief, highest mischief? It's Cleopatra, alas. Alas, it's she, it's she augments the torment of thy pain, betrays thy love, thy life. Oh, alas, betrays Caesar to please, whose grace she seeks to gain, with thought her crown to save and fortune make only thy foe which common ought have been. If her I always loved, and the first flame of her heart-killing love shall burn me last, justly complain I she disloyal is, nor constant is, even as I constant am, to comfort my mishap, despising me no more than when the heavens favoured me. And to cap this belief in her betrayal, he throws in a last bit of wholly historically accurate Roman misogyny. Women are changeable, and you can't trust their feminine beauty, etc. <sighs> but, ah, uh... By nature, women wavering are, each moment changing and rechanging mind. Unwise, who blind in them thinks loyalty ever to find in beauty's company. And that's that for Antony. Now we jump to the chorus, the people of Alexandria, who are pretty scared. The war is lost, the Roman army is outside, and there's a high probability that the army will loot the city and rape and murder the population. What we might call Act 1, Scene 2, but there is no numbering of scenes. The lines are short, it's choppy and harder to follow, but it has an effect. Now, for our recording, I decided to go for a choric effect of multiple voices, usually only two, but it might be more in the final mix. This might turn out to be a terrible idea, but I personally think this chorus needs a less naturalistic sound, though the Act 4 chorus has been done differently, so no consistency there. We open with a slightly opaque couple of stanzas about how certain weather events don't have an effect on their surroundings. The boiling tempest still Makes not sea waters foam, nor still the northern blast disquiets quiet streams, nor who his chest to fill sails to the morning beams on waves, wind tosseth fast, still keeps his ship from home. Nor Jove, still down, doth cast, inflamed with bloody ire, on man, on tree, on hill, his darts of thundering fire. Nor still the heat doth last, on face of parched plain, nor wrinkled cold doth still, on frozen furrows rain. All these things, or gods, are immune to the cruelty of the universe. The poor people of the chorus, however, are not so immune. They are subject to nature and the world. But still, as long we in this low world remain, mishaps our daily mates, our lives do entertain. And woes, which bear no dates, still perch upon our heads. None go, but straight will be some greater in their steads. Nature made us not free when first she made us live, when we began to be, to be began our woe, which growing evermore as dying life doth grow, do more and more us grieve and tire us more and more. 
Our lives are terrible, and in the context of a standing army approaching the city, yeah, it's not good, is it? It's arguably worse for those of a higher status than the lowly chorus. For those in power have more to lose. No stay in fading states, for more to height they reach their fellow miseries. The more to height do stretch, they cling even to the crown, and threatening furious wives from tyrannising pates do often pull it down. You can't fight the tide, the chorus go on, the seas or the sands, nor can we effect the change from night to day. In vain, on waves untried, to shun them go we should, to scythes and massagettis, who near the pole reside. In vain, to boiling sands, which Phoebus' battery beats, for with us still they would, cut seas and compass lands. The darkness no more sure, to join with heavy night, the light which gilds the days to follow tight and pure. No more the shadow light, the body to ensue. Then wretchedness always, us wretches to pursue. And we're back into the issue of how terrible life is and the general situation. It could be better to have never been born. O oh, blessed who never breathed, or whom with pity moved, death from his cradle reaved, and swaddled in his grave, and blessed also he, as curse may blessing have, who low and living free, no prince's charge hath proved. Or shall we say having sentience, enough understanding to appreciate how bad things are, or more specifically here, the gods have never forgiven us for that gift of fire, and so they like to mess us up. By stealing sacred fire, Prometheus then unwise, provoking gods to ire, the heap of ills did stir, and sickness pale and cold, our end which onward spur, to plague our hands too bold, to filch the wealth of skies. In heaven's hate since then, of ill with ill enchained, we race of mortal men, full fraught our breasts were born, and thousand thousand woes, our heavenly souls now torn, which free before from those, no earthly passion pained. And a final cry about how war is never ending, that things just get worse. Things can only get shitter. War and war's bitter cheer, now long time with us stay, and fear of hated foe still still increaseth sore. Our harms worse daily grow, less yesterday they were than now, and will be more tomorrow than today. And thus ends Act One. Or, as you will hear in our version, a pause in the chorus as they listen to Philostratus before they continue speaking, and so close our interpretation of the act. Except in the original, we're off to act two. These are cosmetic issues, but it's really weird. Now, anyway, I said I wasn't going to go on about that. Now, when we first explored this text, I didn't appreciate that Philostratus is actually based on a real person. So whereas I assumed he was just some random philosopher, he's actually someone on a political mission, talking to the chorus, the people in this time of crisis. This aids my thesis that the last chorus speech is effectively interrupted by Philostratus, who gives them, well, not hope exactly, but a promise of clemency from the incoming army. What's up, people? Whatever it is, it can't be that bad. What horrible fury! What cruel rage! O oh, Egypt, so extremely thee torments! Hast thou the gods so angered by thy fault? Hast thou against them some such crime conceived, that their ingrained hand lift up in threats they should desire in thy heart blood to bathe, and that their burning wrath, which naught can quench, should pitiless on us still lighten down? Seriously, folks, you think you've done something to make the gods do this to you? You're not important enough for the gods to care. We are not hewn out of the monstrous mass of giants those which heaven's rack conspired. Ixion's race, false praetor of his loves, nor yet of him who feign lightnings found, nor cruel Tantalus, nor bloody Atreus, 
whose cursed banquet for Thyestus' plague made the beholding sun for horror turn his back and backward from his course return and hastening his wing-footed horse's race plunge him in sea for shame to hide his face while sullen night upon the wandering world for midday's light her starry mantle cast. But, and it's a big but, Whatever the cause, there is trouble right here in Alexandria City. Soldiers are abroad, and it ain't pretty. But what we be, whatever wickedness by us is done, alas! With what more plagues, more eager torments could the gods declare to heaven and earth that us thy hateful hold? With soldiers, strangers, horrible in arms, our land is hid, our people drowned in tears. But terror here and horror naught is seen, and present death prizing our life each hour. Hard at our ports, and at our porches waits. Our conquering foe, hearts fail us, hopes are dead. Our queen laments, and this great emperor sometime would now they did, whom worlds did fear, abandoned, betrayed, now minds no more, but from his evils by hasten death to pass. It's touching everyone, the queen, the mighty Antony. It's not a good time, but... Again, there's a but. Wallowing in despair is not going to solve anything. You need to turn your prayers towards the incoming power of Caesar. Persuade him, through your prayers, to be merciful. Come, you poor people tired with ceaseless plaints, with tears and sighs, make mournful sacrifice on Isis' altars. Not ourselves to save, but soften Caesar and him piteous make to us his prey that so his lenity may change our death into captivity. Look, it might not be death. If we pray really hard, it might just be imprisonment or slavery. Yay! Then we return to the theme set up in Act 1, that this crisis wasn't created by power politics. No, it was created by love. And it's not a good love. It's the bad kind. Strange are the evils the fates on us have brought. Oh, but alas, how far more strange the cause, love, love, alas, whoever would have thought, hath lost this realm inflamed with his fire, love, playing love, which men say kindles not, but in soft hearts hath ashes made our towns, and his sweet shafts, with those shot none are killed, which also not with deaths our lands have filled. Such was the bloody, murdering, hellish love Possess thy heart, fair false, guess Priam's son, firing a brand which after made to burn the Trojan towers by Gratians ruinate. By his love, Priam, Hector, Troilus, Memnum, Deiphobus, Glaucus, thousands mo, whom red Scamander's armour clogged streams, rolled into seas before their dates are dead. So plaguey, so many tempests raiseth, so murdering he, so many cities raiseth, when insolent, blind, lawless, orderless, with mad delight, our sense he entertains. Yeah, love brought down Troy, don't you know? Philostratus goes on to say, this was foretold, signs and portents everywhere. All-knowing gods our racks did us foretell, by signs in earth, by signs in starry spheres, which should have moved us. Had not destiny with too strong hand warped our misery, the comets flaming through the scattered clouds with fiery beams, most like unbraided hairs, the fearful dragon whistling at the banks, and holy Apis ceaseless bellowing has never erst and shedding endless tears, blood raining down from heaven in unknown showers, our gods' dark faces overcast with woe, and dead men's ghosts appearing in the night. Yea, even this night, while all the city stood, oppressed with terror, horror, servile fear, deep silence over all, the sounds were heard, of divers songs and diverse instruments, within the void of air, and howling noise, such as mad Bacchus priests in Bacchus feasts on nicer make, and seemed the company, our city lost, Went to the enemy. Dead men, sounds, the city lost. And here's the punchline, that the people must show their loyalty to the incoming regime, because you are a defeated people. So we forsaken both of gods and men, 
so are we in the mercy of our foes, and we henceforth obedient must become to laws of them who have us overcome. Unpleasant to swallow, but you seriously don't want to tee off the Romans. And with that, the chorus respond. Effectively, in my opinion, a continuation of the Act 1 speech. You can think of this as Act 1, Scene 4, or Act 2, Scene 2, or the end of Act 2, Scene 1, if they were on throughout Philostratus' speech. These issues of labelling acts and scenes only matter if there are multiple intervals. The stage is never completely clear until the end of this chorus speech. The chorus have moved from anger to grief. We are sad. We want sad songs. Lament we our mishaps, drown we with tears our woe, for lamentable haps lamented easy grow, and much less torment bring than when they first did spring. We want that woeful song, wherewith would music's queen doth ease her woes among fresh springtime's bushes green, on pleasant branch alone, renewing ancient moan. We want that moanful sound that prattling progny makes on fields of Thracian ground or streams of Thracian lakes to empt her breast of pain for Itis by her slain. Though Halcyons do still bewailing Saic's lot, the seas with plainings fill which his dead limbs have got, not ever other grave than tomb of waves to have. And though the bird in death that most Meander loves, so sweetly sighs his breath, when death his fury proves, as almost soft his heart, and almost blunts his dart. Lots of examples of lamentation again there, but, and there's another big but here, those examples of classical lamentation have nothing on us. Yet all the plaints of those, nor all their tearful larms, cannot content our woes, nor serve to wail the harms, in soul which we, poor we, to feel enforced be. Nor they of Phoebus bred, in tears can do so well, they for their brother shed, who into Padus fell, rash guide of chariot clear, surveyor of the year. Nor she whom heavenly powers to weeping rock did turn, whose tears distill in showers, and shoe she yet doth mourn, wherewith his top to skies, Mount Sipulus doth rise. Nor weeping drops which flow from bark of wounded tree, that mirror's shame doth show, with ours compared may be, to quench her loving fire, who durst embrace her sire. Nor all the howlings made on Sibyl's sacred hill by eunuchs of her trade, who Attis, Attis still, with doubled cries resound, which echo makes rebound. Those eunuchs have nothing on our laments. No, 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 no. There's no limits to our lamentation. Our plaints no limits stay, nor more than do our woes both infinitely stray, and neither measure knows. In measure let them plain, who measured griefs sustain. And that, I argue, is actually the end of Act 1. The stage can be cleared, the chorus can retire for a drink and a power bar, and we can have a scene where people talk to one another. The other reason I think of these scenes as one unit is that it turns the bulk of Act 1 into some sort of conversation. After a, a prologue from Mark Antony, the chorus speak their mind, are spoken back to by Philostratus, and they speak back to him, albeit they aren't directly responding to each other, they are dancing around the same themes. Like an earlier full-cast audio adaptation, Jack Juggler, we have the issue of lots of speeches before the dramatic action gets going. Though they are totally different plays, they open with three to four long speeches. And they're mostly good speeches, but they are all reactive. In my attempts to retcon the logic of the scene-act structure, I am trying to make the opening more dynamic. 
A prologue, then a flurry of speakers in the chaos of a city expecting disaster. This might be pushing the text too far, but I will do it anyway. And I will make some cuts, probably, though the sequence isn't actually very long. Now, if you have any thoughts about my brief breakdown of this text, or if you have any disagreements with my thoughts, or if I am in plain provable error, let me know. I might re-edit based on your thoughts, or not. And that's it from this spoiler episode. In a moment there'll be a plain text recording of the scenes featured. There are also a host of, frankly far too many, exploring sessions on the podcast and on YouTube, and links to material for the play can be found in the show description. But till then, I've been your host, Robert Crichton, and I leave you with the plain text edit of The Tragedy of Antony by Robert Garnier, translated by Mary Sidney. With Hayden McCabe as Mark Antony, Mark Scanlon as Philostratus, and Robert Crichton, Pamela Flanagan, and Seb Branson as voices in the chorus. Enjoy. Since cruel heavens against me obstinate, since all mishaps of the round engine do conspire my harm, since men, since powers divine, air, earth, and sea are all injurious, and that my queen herself, in whom I lived the idol of my heart, doth me pursue, it's meet I die. For her have I forgone my country, Caesar unto war provoked, for just revenge of sister's wrong, my wife, who moved my queen, ah, me, to jealousy, for love of her in her allurements caught abandoned life. I honour have despised, disdained my friends, and of the stately Rome despoiled the empire of her best attire, contemned that power that made me so much feared, a slave become unto her feeble face. O oh, cruel traitress, woman most unkind, thou dost forsworn my love and life betray, and givest me up to rageful enemy, which soon, oh, fool, will plague thy perjury. Yield it, Pelesium, on this country's shore. Yield it, thou hast my ships and men of war, that naught remains, so destitute am I, but these same arms which on my back I wear. Thou shouldst have had them too, and me unarmed, yield it to Caesar, naked of defence which while I bear, let Caesar never think triumph of me shall his proud chariot grace, nor think with me his glory to adorn on me alive to use his victory. O oh, thou only Cleopatra triumph hast, thou only hast my freedom servile made, thou only hast me vanquished, not by force, for forced I cannot be, but by sweet baits of thy eyes' graces, which it did gain so fast upon my liberty that naught remained. Oh, none else henceforth but thou, my dearest queen, shall glory in commanding Antony. Have Caesar fortune and the gods his friends to him have love and fatal sisters given the scepter of the earth? He never shall subject my life to his obedience. But when that death, my glad refuge, shall have bounded the course of my unsteadfast life and frozen corpse under a marble cold within tomb's bosom widow of my soul, then at his will let him its subject make. Then what he will let Caesar do with me. Make me limb after limb be rent, make me my burial take in sides of Thracian wolf. Poor Antony, alas, what was the day, the days of loss that gave thee thy love? Wretch Antony, 
since Megara Pale with snaky hairs enchained thy misery. The fire thee burnt was never Cupid's fire, for Cupid bears not such a mortal brand. It was some fury's torch, Orestes' torch, which sometimes burnt his mother Merdwin's soul, when wandering mad, rage boiling in his blood, he fled his fault which followed as he fled. Kindled within his bones by a shadow pale of mother slain returned from Stygian Lake. Antony, poor Antony, since that day thy good old hap did far from thee retire. Thy virtue dead, thy glory made alive so oft by martial deeds is gone in smoke. Since then the bay so well thy forehead knew, to Venus myrtles yielded have their place. Trumpets to pipes, field tents to courtly bowers, lances and pikes to dances and to feasts. Since then, O oh wretch, instead of bloody wars thou shouldst have made upon the Parthian kings for Rome and honour filed by Crassus' foil, Thou threwst thou curious off and fearful helm with coward courage unto Egypt's queen, in haste to run about her neck to hang languishing in her arms thy idol make. In some given up to Cleopatra's eyes. Thou breakest at length from thence, as one enchalmed breaks from the enchanter that him strongly held. For thy first reason, spoiling of their force the poison cups of thy fair sorceress, we cured thy sprite, and then on every side thou madest to gain the earth with soldiers swarm. All Asia hid, Euphrates' banks to tremble to see at once so many Romans there breathe horror, rage, and with a threatening eye in mighty squadrons cross his swelling streams. Oh, naught seen but hoarse and fiery sparkling arms, naught heard but hideous noise of muttering troops. The path, the mead, abandoned in their goods, hide them for fear in hills of Hercany, redoubted me, then willing to besiege the great freight head of Medea, thou campest at her walls with vain assault, thy engines fit, ah, mishap not thither brought. So long thou stayst, so long thou dost thee rest, so long thy love with such things nourished reframes, reforms itself, and stealingly retakes his force and re-becomes more great. For of thy queen the looks, the grace, the words, sweetness, allurements, amorous delights enter again thy soul, and day and night, in watch, in sleep, her image followed thee. Not dreaming but of her, repenting still that thou for war had such a goddess left. Thou carest no more for path, nor Parthian bow. Sallies, assaults, encounters, shocks, alarms for ditches, rampiers, wards, and trenchant grounds. I only care in sight of Nilus' streams, sight of that face whose guileful semblance doth wandering in thee infect thy tainted heart. Her absence thee besots, each hour, each hour of stay to thee impatience seems an age. Enough of conquest. Praise thou deemst enough, if soon enough the bristled fields thou see of fruit-filled Egypt, and the stranger flood thy queen's fair eyes, another pharos lights. Oh, return below, dishonoured, despised, in wanton love, a woman thee misleads, sunk in foul sink. Meanwhile, respected not thy wife Octavia and her tender babes, of whom the long contempt against thee whets the sword of Caesar, now thy lord become. 
lost thy great empire. All those goodly towns reverence thy name as rebels now thee leave, rise against thee. And to the ensign's flock of conquering Caesar, who in walls thee round caged in thy hold, scarce master of thyself, late master of so many nations. Yet, yet, which is of grief, extremest grief, which is yet of mischief, highest mischief? It's Cleopatra, alas. Alas, it's she, it's she augments the torment of thy pain, betrays thy love, thy life. Oh, alas, betrays Caesar to please, whose grace she seeks to gain. With thought her crown to save and fortune make only thy foe which common ought have been. If her I always loved, and the first flame of her heart-killing love shall burn me last, justly complain I she disloyal is, nor constant is, even as I constant am. To comfort my mishap, despising me no more than when the heavens favoured me. <laughs> but, ah, uh, by nature women wavering are, each moment changing and rechanging mind. Unwise, who blind in them thinks loyalty ever to find in beauty's company. The, the boiling, boiling tempest, tempest still makes not sea waters foam. Nor still the northern blast disquiets quiet streams, nor who his chest to fill sails to the morning beams on waves, wind tosseth fast, still keeps his ship from home. Nor Jove still down doth cast, inflamed with bloody ire, on man, on tree, on hill, his darts of thundering fire. Nor still the heat doth last on face of parched plain, nor wrinkled cold doth still on frozen furrows rain. But still, as long we in this low world remain, mishaps our daily mates our lives do entertain, and woes which bear no dates still perch upon our heads. None go, but straight will be some greater in their steads. Nature made us not free when first she made us live, when we began to be, to be began our woe, which growing evermore, as dying life doth grow, do more and more us grieve and tire us more and more. No stay in fading states, for more to height they reach their fellow miseries. The more to height do stretch, they cling even to the crown, and threatening furious wise from tyrannizing pates do often pull it down. In vain, on waves untried, to shun them go we should, to scythes and massagettes, who near the pole reside. In vain, to boiling sands, which Phoebus' battery beats, for with us still they would cut seas and compass lands. The darkness no more sure, to join with heavy night, the light which gilds the days to follow titan pure. No more the shadow light, the body to ensue, then wretchedness always us wretches to pursue. O oh, blessed who never breathed, or whom with pity moved, death from his cradle reaved and swaddled in his grave, and blessed also he, as curse may blessing have, who low and living free, no prince's charge hath proved. 
by stealing sacred fire. Prometheus then unwise, provoking gods to ire, the heap of ills did stir, and sickness pale and cold, our end which onward spur, to plague our hands too bold, to filch the wealth of skies. In heaven's hate since then, of ill with ill enchained, we race of mortal men, full fraught of breasts were born, and thousand thousand woes, our heavenly souls now torn, which free before from those, no earthly passion pained. War and war's bitter cheer, now long time with us stay, and fear of hated foe, still still increaseth sore, our harms worse daily grow, less yesterday they were than now, and will be more tomorrow than today. What horrible fury, what cruel rage, O oh, Egypt! So extremely thee torments. Hast thou the gods so angered by thy fault? Hast thou against them some such crime conceived, That their ingrained hand lift up in threats They should desire in thy heart blood to bathe? And that their burning wrath, which naught can quench, Should pitiless on us still lighten down? We are not hewn out of the monstrous mass Of giants those which heaven's rack conspired, Ixion's race, false praetor of his loves, nor yet of him who feigned lightnings found, nor cruel Tantalus, nor bloody Atreus, whose cursed banquet for Thyestus' plague made the beholding sun for horror turn his back, and backward from his course return, and hastening his wing-footed horse's race, plunge him in sea for shame to hide his face, while sullen night upon the wandering world for midday's light her starry mantle cast. But what we be, whatever wickedness by us is done, alas! With what more plagues, more eager torments could the gods declare To heaven and earth that us thy hateful hold? With soldiers, strangers, horrible in arms, Our land is hid, our people drowned in tears. For terror here and horror naught is seen, And present death prizing our life each hour. Hard at our ports and at our porches waits, Our conquering foe, hearts fail us, Hopes are dead, our queen laments, and this great emperor sometime would now they did, whom worlds did fear, abandoned, betrayed, now minds no more, but from his evils by hasten death to pass. Come, you poor people tired with ceaseless plaints, with tears and sighs, make mournful sacrifice on Isis' altars, not ourselves to save, but soften Caesar and him piteous make to us his prey, that so his lenity may change our death into captivity. Strange are the evils the fates on us have brought. Oh, but alas, how far more strange the cause. Love, love, alas, whoever would have thought, hath lost this realm inflamed with his fire. Love, playing love, which men say kindles not, but in soft hearts hath ashes made our towns, and his sweet shafts, with those shot none are killed, which also not with deaths our lands have filled. Such was the bloody, murdering, hellish love possessed thy heart, fair false, guest Priam's son, firing a brand which after made to burn the Trojan towers by Gratians ruinate. By his love, Priam, Hector, Troilus, Memnum, Deiphobus, Glaucus, thousands mo, whom red Scamander's armour clogged streams, Roll into seas before their dates are dead. So plague he, so many tempests raiseth, So murdering he, so many cities raiseth. When insolent, blind, lawless, orderless, With mad delight our sense he entertains. All-knowing gods our racks did us foretell, By signs in earth, by signs in starry spheres, Which should have moved us, Had not destiny with too strong hand warped our misery, the comets flaming through the scattered clouds, with fiery beams, most like unbraided hairs, the fearful dragon whistling at the banks, and holy Apis ceaseless bellowing has never erst, and shedding endless tears, blood raining down from heaven in unknown showers, our gods' dark faces overcast with woe, and dead men's ghosts appearing in the night, yea, even this night, while all the city stood, 
oppressed with terror, horror, servile fear. Deep silence over all. The sounds were heard of divers songs and diverse instruments within the void of air and howling noise. Such as mad Bacchus priests in Bacchus feasts are nicer make. And seemed the company, our city lost, went to the enemy. So we forsaken both of gods and men, so are we in the mercy of our foes. And we henceforth obedient must become to laws of them who have us overcome. Lament we our mishaps, drown we with tears our woe, For lamentable haps, lamented easy grow, And much less torment bring than when they first did spring. We want that woeful song, wherewith would music's queen Doth ease her woes among fresh springtime's bushes green, On pleasant branch alone, renewing ancient moan. We want that moanful sound that prattling progny makes on fields of Thracian ground or streams of Thracian lakes to empt her breast of pain for Itis by her slain. Though Halcyons do still bewailing Saic's lot, the seas with plainings fill which his dead limbs have got, not ever other grave than tomb of waves to have. And though the bird in death that most meander loves, so sweetly sighs his breath, when death his fury proves, as almost soft his heart, and almost blunts his dart. Yet all the plaints of those, nor all their tearful larms, cannot content our woes, nor serve to wail the harms, in soul which we, poor we, to feel enforced be. Nor they of Phoebus bred, in tears can do so well, they for their brother shed, who into Padus fell, rash guide of chariot clear, surveyor of the year. Nor she whom heavenly powers to weeping rock did turn, whose tears distill in showers, and shoe she yet doth mourn, wherewith his top to skies, Mount Sipulus doth rise. Nor weeping drops which flow from bark of wounded tree that mirror's shame doth show with ours compared may be to quench her loving fire who durst embrace her sire. Nor all the howlings made on Sibyl's sacred hill by eunuchs of her trade who Attis, Attis still with doubled cries resound which echo makes rebound. Our plaints no limits stay, nor more than do our woes, both infinitely stray, and neither measure knows. In measure let them plain, who measured griefs sustain. <laughs>